Hi, I'm John Douglas from the Center for Studies in Higher Education, uh, here to uh, moderate, introduce our guest speaker. Uh, very happy to have uh, Sandra Epstein uh, give, I think it's our last talk of the semester for the Center for Studies in Higher Education. And uh, I think it's also extremely uh, opportune that uh, this book has come out and Sandra has done such an, an excellent job. Uh, I want you to note the length of this book. It's not a small piece. And often, as I was telling Sandra, the, often histories of departments or schools sometimes are very PR-oriented and can be very light in weight, but this is not the case in Sandra's uh, uh, effort here, uh, a good scholarly and interesting work that we'll hear more about. I also want to say that uh, this leads us to some degree uh, towards the 150th anniversary of the University of California. There are efforts to think about how to do a uh, celebratory uh, series of events and scholarly activities on the campus here and throughout the UC system. So I think this fits very well with that. Um, I also think it's interesting to hear uh, Sandra talk because we're at a time of significant change, not just in our national politics, but in the shakeout in the MBA programs. Uh, you're probably aware there's a lot of uh, changes in the market and the MBA uh, isn't as quite as valued uh, and the cost uh, uh, structures of many MBA programs are being questioned. Not so really though, I think in Haas's uh, viewpoint, I know that Richard Lyon, uh, I saw some quotes in The Economist by him about that shakeout in the market and you can see the place like Haas, which is such a significant player and has such high quality, uh, will do just fine as the market shifts in that regard. Uh, you know, the other thing just to finally say is that I think also in Sandra's history, which is so interesting, is how uh, the College of Commerce and then later uh, the business school and then Haas Business School evolves, links so much with the land grant tradition of the university uh, that there are perhaps differences, and Sandra can comment on this better than anyone, between say some of the elite privates in their MBA programs and how they've evolved and what they've seen as their mission versus what you see in a land grant university and in particular Berkeley. And that is the story of Berkeley and so many of its professional uh, uh, schools, how important they have been for the overall economic development and socioeconomic mobility of the state itself. So with that, I just wanna say a few things about Sandra. Uh, uh, besides this Im important uh, contribution, on the on the Haas Business School, uh, oh, there's the band. Uh, so getting ready for we hope is a victory <laughs> in the coming weekend. But uh, besides this uh, uh, important book, uh, she also did a history of the law school, and she has a very an interesting uh, professional background. Uh, she has a PhD here uh, from Berkeley, uh, which was in higher education, so right. the, noting uh, uh, that. And she was also has worked in both profit and nonprofit centers, uh, serving, for example, as the public affairs office, officer uh, for the uh, Bank of America, and then also working in the uh, UC office of the president. So uh, a very, very interesting career. So with that, Sandra, thanks so much for being here, uh, and again, uh, Make sure you look at the camera occasionally to some. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Okay. I don't know, would it help with the window being closed? <laughs> I hate to have to compete with such a great band. Okay. Well, John, thank you very much for your introduction. And also thank you to the Center for Studies in Higher Education for inviting me to participate in your excellent lectures. My topic today will be the history of the Haas School of Business, the triumph of a different model. And that's where I want to take you along. The Haas School of Business may seem like a monolithic structure sitting on a hill above the rest of campus. But in fact, since its founding, it has always been integral to the university and gained its stature precisely because it was so much part of the Berkeley campus. To give you some background, interest in including business studies or commerce, as it was called, had its origins in the founding of the state of California. 
for provision for teaching commerce along with other studies such as agriculture, mechanic arts, mines, military science, engineering, law, and, medi and medicine are specifically enumerated in the Organic Act, the constitutional provision in 1868 which established the University of California. It's important to note that California is and remains the only state that makes provision in its constitution for the teaching of commerce. The fields of study were to be added gradually, and it was not until 30 years after the passage of the Organic Act that provision for commerce was implemented on our campus. There are many reasons at the end of the 19th century for interest in introducing commerce into the study of the course of study at the university. San Francisco was the financial capital of the West Coast and an important center of business development. Business activity was becoming more complex as well as an increasingly important part of the state's economy. World events focused attention on relationships with Asia and the Pacific Rim as the victory of the United States in the Spanish-American War led to acquisition of the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam and the annexation of Hawaii. At the campus level, introducing commerce as a formal field of study was expected to increase enrollments and gain greater support from the business community of the state. There was also awareness that business was one of the last major areas of life that had not received attention as a focus of specialized study. Adding new courses of study into American universities received increasing, increased support, starting particularly during the last quarter of the 19th century. Higher education attracted the interest and the financial resources of leading industrials, entrepreneurs, and businessmen, many of whom hope to create monuments to themselves. Many familiar names include Carnegie, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Tulane, Rice, and Stanford. Looking specifically at business education nationally, the first university associated program in business was a Dow was endowed in 1881 at the University of Pennsylvania by Joseph Wharton, a successful industrialist who hoped that the program would aid his campaign for a protective tariff. At Berkeley, the university administration had become increasingly more favorable disposed to introducing the study of commerce. For many years, Arthur Rogers, a prominent attorney and member of the Board of Regents, had argued that the future of world trade was in the Pacific Basin and that California was strategically placed to benefit from this development. He expounded that we need all citizens to be Pacific statesmen and that the university must establish, and I'm quoting, a college of commerce which shall inspire all subordinate education and educate merchants who sh shall become leaders in the commercial enterprises of the world. Roger's message were, messages were favorably received and generalized by the new and increasingly entrepreneurial breed of university administrators at Berkeley. Envisioning a more active and directive role for higher education in California, Presidents Martin Kellogg and particularly his successor, Benjamin Ide Wheeler, were receptive to all initiatives that would further the development of the university. Within this favorable environment, the prospect of a wealthy donor immediately drew their undivided attention. On September 13, 1898, much to the delight of the university community, and one month after the formal opening of the College of Commerce, announcement was made of a gift of $463,000, today approximately $14 million, which was directed by the Regents for the establishment of the College of Commerce. Clara Jane Flood, must be regarded as a highly unlikely person to make such a substantial gift to the university, and particularly for creation of a program in business. Jenny, as she was known, was educated by private teachers and also at Notre Dame Convent in San Jose. Her wealth had been inherited from her father, James Clare Flood, whose fortune was derived from Nevada's Comstock Lode 
the largest silver deposit in history. Known as the Bonanza Prince, his obituary in the New York Times in 1889 noted that his group, and I'm going to quote, added millions to the world's wealth, ruined thousands of men and women, and marked a new era of life on the Pacific Slope. It's, only, it's possible only to conjecture why Miss Flood chose to make this great this gift to the university. Very likely she had been advised by Arthur Rogers, her father's legal advisor, friend, and a fellow regent. Also, she may well have been influenced by the activities of Phoebe Apperson Hurst, who had gained prominence with her generous gifts and involvement with the university. Ms. Flood may also have been made aware of the rumor that the University of Chicago was planning imminently to announce the introduction of an academic program in business. The hope of the Berkeley community was that it could claim the second slot nationally after the Wharton School. Finally, Cora Jane Flood may have been influenced by the rapid growth and increasing eminence of the University of California. In 1900, for example, the university was ranked second in undergraduate enrollment nationally and fifth in total number of students. In the 1907 book by Edwin Slosson called Great American Universities, Berkeley is included in the top 10 universities in the country. Once established within the university, high expectations for the new business program were quickly espoused. The College of Commerce was expected to fit in with the top tier American professional schools that em emphasized the German model of teaching and research. In addition, it embodied the public service ethic of the land grant university. In his inaugural address in 1899, President Wheeler set forth that the new program in commerce was expected to, and I'm gonna quote his words, to develop a class of merchants whose intelligence comprehensiveness, training, and dignity of principle and of character will exalt a sense of professional honor, which is at once moral, conservative, adventurous, and wise. Being politically astute, President Wheeler also heard the voices emanating from the growing progressive movement in California. The progressives saw the state as a wash in concentrated economic power and corrupt party uh, politics and in need of being cleaned up. With better place, what better place than the public university and specifically the College of Commerce to address this challenge by combining excellent scholarship with enlightened public service. The progressive message quickly took hold so that from this time forward, business education at Berkeley was never to be narrowly defined only as education for business. The first announcement of the college in 1898 stated its purpose as follows. This college is intended to afford an opportunity for the scientific study of commerce in all its relations and for higher education of businessmen and higher officers of the civil service. Laying out the basic elements of its curriculum, the announcement set out the, obje the objectives of the four-year program. A, a certain amount of broad general culture, B, studies which may be regarded as supplying all the essential medical, mental tools of the trade for the businessman, and C, op the opportunity to acquire some knowledge of a, particular t of a particular line of trade. The announcement set forth that studied subjects would not only be all movements of trade, but all the conditions, legal, political, economical, and physical upon which trade depends. The study of business took its place at the university by fitting naturally into the traditional structure. The college consisted of an undergraduate course of study leading to a degree. A broad, basic education was the first priority, and to this end, the College of Commerce adopted the same requirements as the colleges of liberal studies. Half the four-year program's courses covered general education. One quarter could be chosen from advanced courses in one area, and one quarter in any course offered on the campus. In reality, 
the economics courses offered in the Department of History and Political Science came closer than any other field to providing the program with a theoretical framework and a scientific base. In addition, the close association with the Department of Economics, which was founded in 1902, gave it a strong tie to the liberal arts and a derived academic resp respectability. Acceptance by the college community was, was facilitated by the acknowledgement that the college had a purpose greater than providing instruction in business topics. The emphasis on the broad nature of the undergraduate program effectively eliminated much choice of electives. The choices were limited even more by the requirement of the college of 18 units of a modern foreign language and eight units of geography for graduation. The broad requirements for commerce students meant also that they were taught by a faculty from across the campus. In spite of the limited practical orientation of business studies, enrollment grew rapidly. From its first class of three students in 1898, in five years, it numbered almost 5% of the entering undergraduate class of the university. The pioneering faculty that gathered for the teaching of commerce during its first decade was a, was a highly eminent group. They came to Berkeley from highly regarded universities such as Harvard, Chicago, and Cornell. Several had studied at German universities with its unique approach to higher education. In addition to being widely respected for their scholarship, they were often the first academics to focus on their areas of specialization. They created advanced knowledge in fields not previously open to scholarship, and with their writings and teaching, shaped the direction of business education on the Berkeley campus, as well as the direction of their fields and of public policy. Interesting examples of the efforts of the College of Commerce to address the tension between the desire to serve the specialized needs of the business community and its efforts to remain legitimate within the scholarly community of the campus can be seen in the development of the first course in marketing, one of the first courses of marketing to be taught in an American university. In 1902, Simon Lippmann, a European-trained instructor, set about to develop a course which to, was to include the concepts of distribution, trade, and commerce. Turning to German treatises and the assumption that marketing methods did not differ substantially from country to country, he described his course as follows, and I quote, from caravans and convoys, from markets and fairs, from fortified settlements established by adventurous merchants to foreign land, in foreign lands to consideration of modern methods of selling and buying goods. Simon Lippmann left Berkeley in 1908, but his ability to integrate his, in his international perspectives with contemporary problems led to his subsequent acknowledgement as a national leader in marketing education and international marketing. Similarly, in 1904, Henry Rand Hatfield was appointed Associate Professor of Accounting, becoming the first full-time academic at an American university with a professorial rank in accounting, in spite of his having no formal training or study in the field. His background had included a doctorate in political economy from the University of Chicago and study in Germany. His modern text, his classic text, Modern Accounting, Its Principles, and Some of Its Problems, brought together not only American sources, but a vast array of codes, decisions, and precedents from England and the European continent, and established Hatfield as the Dean of Accounting Teachers. I also should note that 38,000 copies of his book were sold before the first revisions in 1927. A third significant addition to the Commerce faculty was made in 1913 with the appointment of Carlton Parker as Assistant Professor of Industrial Economy. Parker, a graduate of Berkeley who had done his graduate work at Harvard, was assigned to teach the basic course in labor problems and organization, as well as two courses in modern industrialism and the American workman. Parker's approach 
to labor topics was highly unconventional, drawing on his own experience with migrant laborers and other disadvantaged groups. He studied California's migrant populations, most of them Mexican and undocumented, firsthand by going into the camps and interviewing the workers. In the classroom, he taught that economics needed to reject the hedonistic assumptions at the base of economics and ally itself with the sciences of human behavior, psychology, and biology. The New York Republic, the New Republic was to cite Parker as, quote, the first of our economists, not only to analyze the psychology of labor, but to make his analysis the basis for an applied technique of industrial and social reconstruction. The period from 1910 saw the increase in number of practical business courses. Courses appeared to be added to the curriculum as their importance appeared in the economy. And by the 1920s, the College of Commerce listed majors in nine fields. For students studying business, the curriculum was rich, but it was also restrictive. The announcement for the college for 1922 continued to stress the importance of broader academic study and ended a description of a typical program for the junior and senior years by stating, and I quote, no man is well trained in commerce who is trained in commerce only. This statement was in line with the regulation that the liberal offerings of the college were dictated by letters and sciences and were the same for all enrolled students. It's important to keep in mind that although the core, core faculty giving courses directly related to commerce was small, the faculty listings include all instructors giving courses open to students enrolled in the college. That could include a wide variety of courses from mathematics to oriental literature, for example. In reality, the largest number of courses was chosen from the economics department, and it was that department that became home for the commerce faculty. In looking at the announcements of courses for the decades leading up to the 1930s, for example, it's difficult to see the College of Commerce and the Economics Department as separate programs. The studies appear to be interchangeable. In addition, the Economics Department was the key personnel unit for commerce faculty. This very close association served well for both purposes. The economics department could thrive and grow as a result of the significant funding it received, particularly from the flood endowment. And the business program gained campus legitimacy derived from its cl close association with this major academic department. The perception that business studies is rooted in the strong academic tradition continues to this present day. E.T. Grether, the dean of the business school for 20 years, continued throughout his entire career to be identified as the Flood Professor of Economics. In addition, two of the five Berkeley economists to hold Nobel Prizes in Economic Sciences, John Harsani and Oliver Williamson, were both business school professors. The Depression of the 1930s and its aftermath focused attention on the country's business and economic climate and provided opportunities for the College of Commerce faculty to participate in the public debate around broader and more policy-oriented issues. There was an increase in curricular offerings as a result of the greater complexity of business organizations and increased governmental participation in business affairs. Increasingly, the research focus for commerce sh faculty shifted toward issues of business and government relations, the effects of the New Deal, and the social implications of economic disruption. These interests brought the commerce faculty closer to the work of many others on the campus. The economic crisis also drew large numbers of the business faculty into public service at all levels. Courses proliferated and, in grew, and enrollments grew significantly during this period, but the announcement of the college continued to assert that its mission was, quote, to provide students with a sound, non-specialized mental training, which would enable them to attack business pro problems effectively. By the end of the 1930s, the Berkeley campus and the College of Commerce both experienced tremendous growth in enrollment and in programmatic offerings. For the campus, enrollment grew from approximately 12,000 in 1930 to almost 18,000 in 1939, an increase of more than 50%. 
For the college, the percentage increase was similar and contributed to its role as a major presence on the campus. Paradoxically, however, the College of Commerce continued to be a traditional four-year undergraduate program tied tightly to the economics department. Efforts had been made as early as 1916 to change the status of that program, but had been unsuccessful, principally because campus budget committees or academic senate committees failed to accept that the study of business could fit into the strong academic community. With the appointment of a new dean, Professor E.T. Grether, concerted efforts were revived to give the business program a more independent status. As the first step in this process, a proposal was approved in 1942 to create the Department of Business Administration. The new department also provided the opportunity to modernize the name of the business program. Now designated a department, the program could, form, could claim its own faculty instead of having to borrow from across campus. For the first time since its founding, the dean could control the hiring and promotion of faculty and could seek out individuals who had a primary professional commitment to the goals of the business program. Having gained departmental status, the groundwork was laid for conversion of the college to a school. This was officially accomplished in 1943 with a two-year upper division program leading to a Bachelor of Science degree and a graduate program leading to the MBA degree. Although the MBA degree had been the recognized degree at most American business schools, it was not until almost 50 years after the founding of the business program here that the, that the degree was introduced at Berkeley. At the com commencement in 1944, the MBA degree was, in, was, was awarded to, free, to three students. Along with structural changes, business school faculty organized to solidify its campus position by creating organized research units. The Bureau of Business and Economic Research, the first of its kind on the West Coast, was established in 1941 for the purpose of facilitating research into the problems of economics and business with particular focus on California and the Pacific Coast. Similarly, in 1945, the California legislature passed legislation authorizing the Institute of Industrial Relations as an interdisciplinary research center on both the Berkeley and the UCLA campuses. Under the leadership of Clark Kerr, its first director, a scholarly approach coalesced on the campus that came to be known as the California School or the Berkeley School. The relationship between the School of Business and the Economics Department continued initially to be operationally close. Announcements for the business school listed the courses in two groupings, business administration and economics. Faculty members were at times appointed to in business administration and at other times to economics, according to their expertise and the resources available in each group. Gradually, however, fewer professors in economics taught the offerings for business students, and the economists hired directly into the business school formed a larger and more identifiable cohort. Dean Grether's ambitions for the business school were supported by his act of recruiting. His criteria for an offer was whether a, pro a prospect could belong, first in the university and second in the business school. The dean limited his search to a handful of schools and found the greatest number of prospects in the East, particularly at Harvard. One estimate held that in the 1950s, 80% of the business school faculty were Harvard PhDs. Some opined that both the business and the economics faculty at Berkeley could be considered satellites of Harvard's economics department. In general, however, the emphasis for each department gained some differentiation as Dean Grether tended to recruit young scholars who had a greater interest in applied rather than theoretical economics. Unlike most business schools in the country, the Berkeley faculty refused to admit to teaching in the field of management and clung to their primary identification with economics. In fact, some faculty were indignant at being referred to as teaching management, while others described themselves as, quote, not business administration types. 
Attention next turned to introducing a doctoral, doctoral degree into the business program. Initially, support for the degree was not great since advanced students in accounting, marketing, and finance could earn a PhD in economics. By 1955, however, stronger arguments were made about the greater complexity of modern business organizations, and that business studies now included extensive areas in which departments of economics had little interest. The first PhD in business administration was awarded in 1961. In 1959, the greatly increased interest in American business education led two major foundations to commission reports. The Ford Foundation study, known for its authors Robert Gordon and James Howe, and the Carnegie Corporation report offered by Frank Pearson came to similar, highly critical conclusions about the state of university business education, focusing on low academic standards, excessive vocationalism, neglect of research, and poor quality of students. Paradoxically, the conclusions of the author tended to validate the position that the program that had developed at Berkeley. They emphasized that business schools needed to move toward a broader and academically rigorous program with higher standards for both faculty and students and greater appreciation of the contributions to be made by integrating a broad variety of non-business disciplines. They stressed the importance of an undergraduate program emphasizing the liberal arts and social sciences. At the graduate level, the Berkeley MBA was set forth as an, exec, as an excellent example at which a graduate core was developed by which students spent their first year in more general topics before going on to specialization and electives. In addition, as a result of the reports, at almost all elite business schools, economists came to dominate business school faculties, not only in finance, but in other areas as well. This approach, of course, it was very much in line with what business studies at Berkeley had always been. It must be regarded as ironic that while business studies at Berkeley had been a very popular major with high enrollments, it never had a permanent home of its own. In the late 1950s, however, generous state support set a Berkeley campus building program in high gear, and a building for business was now on the drawing board. In selecting a site, Dean Grether was clear in his desire for a central location that integrated the business school into the rest of the campus, both physically and academically. Thus, the new business school building became part of the planning for the proposed social sciences and administrative cluster near the main library. Barrows Hall, occupied in 1964, combined business with the departments of economics, political science and soci sociology, along with a shared social science library. Having a home in Barrows Hall created an anomalous situation for the Berkeley Business School. It reinforced the view on campus that the business faculty was a group of serious scholars doing serious research. However, the physical location and its integ stated integration with the rest of campus created the perception nationally that business at Berkeley did not have the cachet of more managerial-oriented schools, such as Harvard, Stanford, and <coughs> MIT. Settling into a permanent home was accompanied by the introduction of business and public policy as a new formal area of study and research. The first announcement of the College of Congress had stated that co course offerings would not be all, quote, movements of trade, but all the conditions of legal, political, economical, and physical upon which trade depends. Not until 1959 was a formal program adopted into the curriculum to incorporate political, social, and legal context into, the business, into business instruction. The new program was accompanied by hiring of additional faculty, particularly those legally trained, but then initially interdisciplinary, and the introduction of a new and required course in the area. Berkeley was not alone in developing this program, but much of the earliest and most significant work was done here, and the program was, now, was nationally acknowledged as being referred to as the Berkeley School of Social Issues in Management. 
The strength of the program was confirmed also when Berkeley awarded the first PhD in the field of business and public policy, one of the few business schools nationally to award a doctorate in this area. In addition to curricular innovation, the School of, P of Business Administration in the late 1960s introduced one of the earliest and most comprehensive programs to respond to the economic and social inequities existing in American cities. The Office of Urban Programs was established to boost economic development in the poorer areas of Berkeley and Oakland. This included assigning students to provide assistance to small businesses, as well as expanding the opportunities for graduate business to a pool of minority and low-income students. In the 1980s, a strongly more quantitative approach to business was added to the curriculum, but it took its place together with new courses in the area of international business, urban affairs, entrepreneurship, and non-profit management. However, within a climate of decreasing resources and the increased popularity of the MBA degree, the issue of the undergraduate business school was resurrected. Once again, in spite of strong pressure to abolish the small elite undergraduate program, it was argued that not only did the school provide an excellent general purpose education, but it set the model nationally for a full service business program. Of great importance, the undergraduate program provided opportunities for many students of the state who would have been unable to financially earn an MBA degree. The issue of, the, of was settled when the vote of the faculty, confirmed by the Academic Senate, was to retain the upper division program, the upper division two-year program, as it had been for the previous 40 years also confirming it as the only undergraduate school of business in the UC system. Complaints about the inadequacies of Barrows Hall had abounded since its opening, but by the end of the 1970s, the frustrating limitations of the building became a perpetual topic of discussion for faculty, students, and alumni. It was pointed out that the business school was the only professional school on the campus without a building of its own. By the end of the 1980s, however, a campus site was chosen and a significant organizational structure put in place for a capital campaign for a new building for business. For business. In 1989, the capstone gift was secured from the Haas Family Foundation and the school was formally named the Walter Haas, was na formally named for Walter Haas Sr., who had graduated with the class of 1910. Construction was begun in 1992 and completed in 1995. The entire cost of the $55 million building was financed by private contributions. The architectural critic for the New York Times observed that the Haas School was, quote, one of the finest academic buildings in recent years, that it was full of wisdom about the nature of community, the nature of campuses, and the nature of business. As it had displayed from its beginning, the business program outlined in the late 1980s reinforced the view that, quote, instead of being a sole provider, it must expand to facilitate, integrate, and broker the facilities of the whole campus. Among the programs introduced or developed further at this time were programs in organizational strategy, program in innovation and entrepreneurship, and the program in international competitiveness. Also included were linkages to departments on campus such as law, public policy, engineering, city planning, environmental design, public health, and Asian studies. The impulse to make a difference in the world also impelled the Berkeley business faculty service consultants to the developing economy of Indonesia, where a group of young economists gained the title of the Berkeley Mafia, and to assist with the early development of the Dalian Institute of Technology in China and partner with St. Petersburg University to develop the first American style Russian American style business school in a Russian university. The directions put forth 118 years ago continue to this day. The 10-year graduate division review completed in 1995 observed that the Haas school was resided was regarded by many as, quote, the most scholarly 
of the major business schools, and that, quote, the creator contributions to the faculty are targeted toward audiences of scholars, not business practitioners. In addition, Dean Richard Lyons had captured the qualities of leadership that were rooted in the basic values of the school's founding by setting up as a Berkeley brand, questioning the status quo, confidence without attitude, being students always, and going beyond yourself. The Haas School is a leading American business school, but most importantly, it enjoys this status because it has been part of a great public university. It absorbed the values, utilized campus resources, and customized its needs to create a unique institution. We at Berkeley can feel justifiably proud that academic excellence combined with a unique culture and a congenial environment have resulted in the triumph of a different model. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we're going to go to some questions, but uh, I'm going to ask the first question, then we'll go <laughs> to Ami. And that is, I noticed in your book you do discuss uh, international students in the uh, College of Commerce. And in around 1921, there was a quite a controversy on the campus about the number of international students. This sounds, it rings a little familiar to you. <laughs> and uh, uh, part of the justification was that uh, having a lot of international students at uh, Berkeley and in the, uh, uh, in the College of Commerce was part of this outreach effort, uh, this kind of seeing the world and especially Asia as part of uh, our, uh, our, our ring of influence and, uh, uh, and knowledge gathering. Uh, but there is also some who have said this is all part of a larger kind of imperialistic uh, approach that Berkeley took. I don't know if you're aware of some literature that writes on that. But uh, could you just comment a little bit about the role of international students that you're, that you're aware of uh, in uh, the College of Commerce over time? Well, there were international students, but in the early days, that was just usually a very small number, individuals, two, three, but certainly not a larger group. Um, later days, most certainly, the economics department was attractive to international students, and um, many came here. But um, I, I am not aware of the fact that there was any tension around that or that it was done as an imperialistic approach to uh, bringing them here to this campus. You probably know much more than I do about that topic. <laughs> okay. Hi, Sandra. Thanks very much for your interesting history on the school. Um, I, you didn't mention anything about the executive uh, MBA, which uh, is a, a very important financial part of yes. the school. And I wonder if you could comment about the extent to which it subsidizes the Berkeley model and the extent to which perhaps it undermines it. Uh, and what does it mean to have this very strong and highly internationally oriented um, self-funding, subsidizing executive MBA as part of the larger school of, it, uh, of uh, business administration? The executive MBA programs were really introduced in the, in the late 60s, early 70s and gained um, great attention and, and enrollment uh, after that time. Uh, yes, they are absolutely a big source of income for the school. And um, I, am, I am not, however, I don't essentially get the sense that the program on campus is undermined by the executive programs. They're very, very different constituencies. Um, and uh, while I know the school enjoy, and the campus enjoys the income that comes in that way, um, I think the program itself, the school itself, uh, really is producing, I'll use this, a different model than what they are um, actually presenting in the executive programs. So you don't consider it part of the school as a separate? Oh, it's definitely part of the, of the larger program, but I don't feel that it, it is um, drawing attention away 
uh, or support away, better term, uh, from the basic program. The undergraduate program here at Berkeley is highly, highly subscribed, very popular, so that enrollment is never a question. The graduate program, the school of the regular on-campus graduate programs um, are highly uh, sought after for admission. And they're different worlds. The executive MBA, um, which is an excellent program too, uh, definitely speaks to a different constituency. And I don't have the feeling that we've got a tension there that is um, undermining the programs. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Lowell Moorcroft, and I'm a member of the community, not an academic. And uh, when I drifted onto campus as a retiree in the early 2000s and began attending all kinds of events like this, uh, I discovered the business school library, which was quite extensive. And uh, I, I loved the building, too. It's, uh, I forget the architect. But um, at any rate, um, I felt very comfortable there. And there was a lot of critical literature in the library, um, a fair number of Marxist treatments, and, uh, and also just contemporary critiques of business. And I, I found that you know, pleasantly surprising, I guess. So I developed an extensive reading list of books, only to discover that the library had decided to disband itself as a, as a repository of books. And, uh, and so they moved. And I was um, fearful of the loss of all these books that I was reading, I thought they would get dumped in the Northern California Regional Library uh, a facility. Instead, almost all of them went to Doe, and, uh, and at least my, my reading list, maybe 200 books. And I took that as some sort of index of reintegration of, of business with economics, because economics is in Evans Hall, just up the hill. So I was wondering whether you might comment on the library, if you know about it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the, the opening of the Long Business Library was a major, major accomplishment for those interested in the School of Business because they had never had a library of their own. But when the new school opened, that became uh, theirs, and as I say, a great, a great joy. Um, I have a feeling that the financial situation of the various libraries on campus is probably dictating where, which ones will be able to maintain all of the resources that they would like to have. And um, finances being what they are, particularly now, the fact that so much has moved to Doe tells that the technical support and uh, other facilities, that other services uh, at that library um, are still available, but the collection of books, unfortunately, no longer is there. Short, please, short questions, and please identify yourself. Is it appropriate for me to say? No, you can. Okay. Um, I'm Ed Epstein, Professor Emeritus at the Haas School. Uh, several points. One, in terms of <clears throat> executive education, uh, there is greater emphasis than in the traditional programs in having adjuncts very often drawn from uh, professional experiences in business or uh, uh, public administration or, or whatever to work with these different students who are looking for uh, a much more applied approach. Uh, I don't think it's undermined, if you will, the ethos, the teaching of, and scholarly ethos of uh, uh, the, the core faculty. Second point is, uh, I think Long Library, uh, remember Long's Drugs? That was uh, the donors. Uh, in common with libraries across campus are increasingly, or is increasingly digitalized. So the notion is, most well, certainly with journals, and also with a lot of books that you can get them online and that uh, the space can be better utilized in that fashion. Thirdly, uh, you may be uh, 
surprised that you found readings by Marx and Max Weber and all sorts of folk like that. Those books first. Huh? <laughs> no, Not here. Not that's, that's because they were assigned in courses and taught in courses, going to the point that uh, uh, Sandra was making. So. Okay, great. Do you want to make a, com a comment, Sandra? No? I don't think. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm Sheila Humphreys from the College of Engineering. I got here 10 minutes late, so I apologize if you covered this, but did you speak at all about the early uh, women who attended the College of Commerce and then their growth throughout the decades? I'm very aware of Janet Yellen and Laura Tyson as prominent faculty in government service, but I, haven't, I don't know anything about the growth of women over, the, over time. I did not include um, the topic of women at the business school, even though I could, because I did follow it along. Actually, um, there was a woman who was in the graduating class of 1903, so there was a woman then, and along the way, there were small numbers, um, nothing large, uh, except during wartime, when you would have had a greater representation of women. Um, and but not until the late seventies, uh, late sixties, rather early seventies, do you get um, a critical? I'll use the word critical mass of women in the business school as well as law school and the various professional programs. Uh, you know, with engineering, when you, it's later, I would assume, than the early seventies. But uh, with business, it is that point. Um, you mentioned two very prominent women, Laura Tyson, who was dean of the school, and as well as the economic advisor during the Clinton administration, and Janet Yellen, who currently um, is heading up the Federal Reserve Bank. So um, women at this point, um, I think at last, last look, uh, were probably more than half of the enrolled students uh, in the School of Business. Is, when you talk to critical mass, I mean 15? Critical mass, 15 percent? Of? You, um, you referred to their a achieving large critical number. mass. Yes. 15 percent? Yes. Yeah, by the end of the 60s, mm -hmm. beginning of the 70s, you're getting most certainly. And I can provide, I can give you this information. I did not include that because that's another whole topic, the role of women. Um, but it is Well, maybe you could comment a little more, because I know in your book you also, uh, there were a number of women who were on the faculty, uh, or were teaching at least, uh, beginning in the 30s. Is that Well, there was, there was one woman oh. teaching in the faculty in the 1930s who uh, essentially taught accounting. She was the only doctoral student of... Um, uh, Professor Hatfield, and she taught um, in a, um, she never had a, a full-time faculty appointment, but uh, essentially in an adjunct position, was a very, very popular teacher, and uh, retired as a, I think they finally made assistant professor emeritus for her. Not until approximately 1960 does the first uh, appointment occur for a woman uh, to the business faculty, and that's Carlene Roberts, who is now emeritus, um, but was essentially the first woman to be uh, given a faculty appointment. Um, since that point, um, women have been hired as particular fields um, seem to uh, be uh, introduced that where they've got where they've been able to get good training, um, but I don't know the current number on the um, on the Berkeley faculty. It's it's large. It's it's significant, but I can't give you a percentage. And the name of the woman who was teaching, Hatfield student. Yeah, her name. Her last name was Green. Uh, I'm trying to think of her first That's name. Okay. I can get it Later, to you. Yeah. So perhaps one final question, and because we uh, need to uh, close the session and we have lunch for those who are here, 
would like to uh, enjoy that. And my question is, uh, what could you say are one of the two uh, major studies that came out of the College of uh, Commerce that had an impact on California uh, and its development uh, economically? Uh, I know that there are a couple of right uh, important studies and things that came out of the College of Commerce. Well, you had, of course, the um, Institute of Industrial Relations, and you had um, the um, various programs that had programs going with uh, the state. Um, as far as a specific program itself, um, I'm not really thinking of of um, a specific one that can help you. Uh, they, um, there was always a very close relationship of faculty in the school to um, what was going on in the state. There was also a very interesting relationship between Dean Grether and Earl Warren when he was governor of the state of California. In fact, Earl Warren at various times would call Dean Grether to find out what was happening on the campus. And um, the two of them had a very special relationship that uh, ended with um, Dean Grether also being appointed some, to major committees uh, at the state level. But um, okay. there was always public service as basic. Okay, with that, that's a nice tie-in because Earl Warren played in the band. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> and I don't know if you know who is the majorette. Uh, Robert Gordon Sproul. So oh, that was that's early. That's a, a throwback. But anyway. Was with, there another? Yeah, yeah. Studies by Sher Mazo. Oh, that's right. In real estate. Studies by Sher Mazo and also Fred Balderson yeah, Fred. had had large impact in terms of financial regulation in California. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And also to note that Fred Balderson also wrote kind of a the book about uh, college administration and finance, actually, for right. many long periods. But with that, thank you so much, Sandra. A round of applause for our. Speaker.